White House, Washington, D.C. The President of the United States of America. Good evening, fellow Americans. I leave in just a few minutes on a three-week journey halfway around the world. During this mission of peace and goodwill, <clears throat> I hope to promote a better understanding of America and to learn more of our friends abroad. In every country, I hope to make widely known America's deepest desire, a world in which all nations may prosper in freedom, justice, and peace, <clears throat> unmolested and unafraid. We have heard much of the phrase, peace and friendship. This phrase in expressing the aspirations of America is not complete. We should say instead, peace and friendship in freedom. This, I think, is America's real message to the world. destination of President Eisenhower's 22,000-mile journey to 11 countries, Ciampino Airport, Rome, Italy. Rain fails to affect the spirit of both the visitor from the United States and the Italian dignitaries here to welcome him. President Giovanni Granchi accompanies President Eisenhower in a review of the Honor Guard. Then into Rome, bearing what he describes as a simple message from his countrymen. We want to live in peace and friendship, in freedom. A message applauded by the Italian people. 48 rewarding hours are ahead of President Eisenhower, starting from the moment of his arrival at Quirinale Palace, the official residence of the President of Italy. A series of conversations is held covering a wide range of international topics in which both Italy and the United States are interested. The Italian delegation is headed by Prime Minister Antonio Segni, along with the Foreign Minister Giuseppe Pella. Conversations are animated by an understanding that the way to world peace lies through application of the principles of the United Nations Charter. They agree that increased free world participation in assistance to the less developed areas is necessary. At night, Quirinale Palace is displayed to its best advantage at a formal dinner and reception given in President Eisenhower's honor by President and Mrs. Gronke. Mr. Eisenhower's son and daughter-in-law, Major and Mrs. John Eisenhower, accompany him throughout his journey, which President Gronke describes as a trip we feel will make a great contribution to the cause of peace and justice in the world. Morning. Through a cold rain, President Eisenhower visits the tomb of the unknown soldier the monument to Italian war dead. A tribute by a former Supreme Commander in a shattering world war to those who had fallen in battle. And a prayerful hope that war will not again darken the lives of human beings. Before leaving Italy, President Eisenhower and his party arrive at St. Peter's Square. Vatican prelates escort them to the study of His Holiness, Pope John XXIII.
Pope John welcomes the President as a representative of the United States. He says, We rejoice on seeing your country striving so actively under the guidance and impulse of its worthy President toward the lofty ideals of a loyal and effective concord between nations. In a typical comment, an Italian newspaper summed up the impact of the president's visit to Italy. He represents a moral conscience, a spiritual force. The world must be inspired by his goodwill mission. The comments of the press reflect strong endorsement by the Italian people of peace and friendship in freedom. The whole country has taken the visitor to its heart. He knows, as he says goodbye at the airport, he carries the good wishes of the Italian people along with him on his journey. From Rome to Ankara, Turkey is less than three hours by jet plane. The flag bedecked capital city is prepared to write a new page in the history of the close friendship between Turkey and the United States. They have met before these two leaders. President Jalal Bayar of Turkey has been President Eisenhower's guest in the United States. In his former capacity as Supreme Commander of NATO, General Eisenhower has visited Turkey. But this is his first visit since election as president. And the Turkish people are determined he shall never forget his welcome to Turkey. Yet very near, reads the mammoth sign over Ataturk Boulevard. Yes, Turkey and the United States may be separated by great distances, but they stand together. Throughout the day and into the night blaze the signs, expressions of affection toward the American visitor and the people he represents. Not long afterwards, a visit to the tomb of the great president, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, founder of the Turkish Republic. After receiving an honorary degree from Ankara University, President Eisenhower and Prime Minister Menderes helicopter to the airport. Take our love back home. A journey of friendship continues. <laughs> Hours later, President Eisenhower is in Karachi, bedecked with Pakistani and American flags. Riding with his host, President Ayub Khan, the visitor from America is the center of one of the most impressive public demonstrations seen in Karachi since Pakistan became an independent nation. As the two presidents ride in from the airport, half the city's population lines the streets and crowds the windows and balconies of every building. At a formal dinner, the visitor from America is conferred the Nishan-e-Pakistan, the nation's highest civil award.
gifts are exchanged between the two leaders in a spirit of warm, congenial friendship. A display of ancient coins is of particular interest, as is the entertainment after dinner. Sword dances by men of the Frontier Force Regiment. The next day, another meeting and discussion between the two presidents. President Ayub has voiced the hope that the visitor would get a close glimpse of a young nation determined to make its full contribution to the cause of the free world. Only a short walk from the president's house, the visitor is to be treated to a display of writing skill. Large crowds manifest their affection for President Eisenhower. As a young man born in Texas and raised in the atmosphere of the western frontier, their guest is keenly interested in horsemanship, and he will not soon forget the demonstration seen here this day. Thousands of youngsters in the crowd are spellbound at the effortless leap over barriers. The lancing skill of riders who spear a tiny wooden peg at full gallop A solemn quiet lies over the marble tomb of Muhammad Ali Jinnah as the American leader pays his respects to the founder of Pakistan. In President Eisenhower's words, we Americans have always admired the courage and independent spirit of the Pakistan people and have respected them because of their religious and spiritual devotion. Later, the visitor is a delighted spectator at a test match between the Australian and Pakistan cricket teams. That same afternoon at the polo grounds, President Eisenhower is introduced at a citizen's welcome. The president says, there is more than one kind of courage. There is a patient courage that in spite of discouragement enables a man to persist in working tirelessly to improve the lot of himself, his family, and his community. The common ideals of the two staunch allies are strengthened by the president's visit to Pakistan. From Karachi to Kabul, Afghanistan, Greeting President Eisenhower at Bagram Airport is King Mohammed Zahir. In Afghanistan, the story is very much the same. From all walks of life, in all age groups, outpouring of affection. From the leader of the nation, from all the population, the welcome and encouragement President Eisenhower has received at every stop on his journey. Respect for the man, belief in peace and friendship in freedom. That is the story of the president's visit to Afghanistan. On to New Delhi. 
Among the dignitaries at the airport are President Prasad and Prime Minister Nehru. President Eisenhower says that he is about to embark on his personal discovery of India. He is soon to discover how Indians regard him and the United States. Everywhere he goes in New Delhi the next four days, a tumultuous demonstration of welcome to an awaited visitor. A memorial marking the ground where Gandhi was cremated. Gandhi said in 1944, my work will be finished if I succeed in carrying conviction to the human family that every man or woman is the guardian of his or her self-respect and liberty. For Americans, the counsels of Gandhi are as applicable today as when they were uttered. In the courtyard of the residence where he is staying, President Eisenhower greets some girl guides and boy scouts. As a father and grandfather himself, the American president is particularly interested in youth organizations. And he finds a moment for an informal chat with the youngsters. Now he heads toward the parliament building. Here he is to address the 750 members of both houses of parliament. It is a speech interrupted by applause more than 15 times. I come here representing a nation that wants not an acre of another people's land, that seeks no control of another people's government, that pursues no program of expansion in commerce or politics or power of any sort at, a, at another people's expense. It is a nation ready to cooperate toward achievement of mankind's deep eternal aspirations for peace and freedom. Mr. Eisenhower goes on to say that America watches with friendly concern the valiant efforts of other nations for a better life, particularly those who have newly achieved their independence. Stating that controlled universal disarmament is the imperative of our time, the president asks, Can we not join in a five-year or a 50-year plan against mistrust and misgiving and fixation on the wrongs of the past? A carved sandalwood and ivory table depicting a scene from India's storied past is among the many gifts presented the visitor by President Prasad. The occasion, a state dinner at the President's palace. The dinner is followed by a recital of Indian music and dances.
At the University of Delhi, a large crowd applauds the entrance of the visitor from America. The President of the United States is to be awarded the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws by Vice President Radhakrishnan. Responding, President Eisenhower says, the time has come for mankind to make the role of law in international affairs as normal as it is now in domestic affairs. The halfway point in President Eisenhower's four and a half day visit to India on his tour of three continents is at the opening of the 14 nation World Agricultural Fair. It is the first World Agricultural Fair in history, stressing efforts by all nations to increase food production. A crowd of 25,000 hears an urgent appeal for a worldwide war against hunger. And at the opening of the United States exhibit, the man with a message of peace and freedom calls for a war against hunger in the context of the American exhibit's theme, food, family, friendship, freedom. From the problems of the 20th century, to the contemplation of a fabulous memorial built in the 17th, the Taj Mahal. For 40 minutes, guided by Prime Minister Nehru, the President and his daughter-in-law tour the gardens and marble terraces of one of the most famous man-made works in the world. For the visitor from faraway America, a change of pace, a moment of repose, among the pools and fountains of the Taj Mahal. Not far from the Taj, an Indian village prepares for a visit from Mr. Eisenhower as his discovery of India continues. Then back by plane to New Delhi, where all that afternoon a crowd is forming at the Ram Leela ground, a long and broad expanse separating New Delhi from the old city. They have come to hear and see Eisenhower. His stay in India is nearing its close. Shortly before, in introducing the president, Prime Minister Nehru had said, you have found an echo in the hearts of our millions. Next stop, Tehran. Through the freezing morning air, a motorcade passes the 10-mile route from the airport into the city, allowing countless Iranians a glimpse of the visitor. Truly a pathway of friendship. In the Shah's palace, the American president has a private talk with the Shah, 
is Imperial Majesty Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. The visitor is to praise the fortitude and spirit of independence of the Iranian people. Iran's parliament invites the President of the United States to address a joint session in the new Senate building. In his speech, he is to voice the respect he bears the people who are his hosts. Says he, I know I speak for the American people when I say we are proud to count so valiant a nation as a partner. On travels the American Chief of State with vivid recollections of the six countries already visited. He eagerly anticipates the next stop, the land of the Hellenes. He is met by His Majesty King Paul. The American was last in Greece seven years before. He is to find many changes, evidences of continued growth, but the valor of the Greeks he finds unchanged. Nor has the passage of years diminished the respect of Greeks for Dwight David Eisenhower, or affectionately, Ike. Wherever he goes, he reiterates his theme, peace and friendship in freedom. A warm personality draws an equally warm response from the many thousands who see and hear him coming and going in Athens. At the royal palace, the American leader has a long and searching conversation with Prime Minister Konstantin Karamanlis. Shortly afterwards, a citation is read the American president. He is presented with an honorary membership in the Academy of Athens. More than a score of centuries ago, the president said in an address to the Greek parliament, democracy in its principles and its practices first won the hearts and minds of men in this ancient city of Athens. In our common dedication to the ideals of democracy, our two countries feel a basic kinship. Outside Athens Harbor, a helicopter puts down aboard the American cruiser Des Moines, headquarters for the American Chief of State for the next two days. Then the Des Moines heads south into the Mediterranean. Destination, Tunisia. From the ship, a helicopter flies the president and his party onto the soil of Tunisia. Sixteen years have passed since the American leader was last here as a commander of military forces. Now, his mission is utterly different. He enjoys breakfast and a spirited talk with the cherished friend of the United States, the President Habib Bourguiba. Outside, a delightful surprise awaits the man from America, a three-year-old bay horse, a gift of the people of Tunisia. Then, departure.
by sea again to Toulon, France. President de Gaulle's personal representative is among those present to welcome the name and the person of Eisenhower to French soil once again. Then by rail, north toward Paris. Purpose of the journey, a meeting of Great Britain, France, the Federal Republic of Germany, and the United States. Arriving late at night, the American Chief of State is met by President Charles de Gaulle of France. The ancient chateau of Rambouillet near Paris is the scene of the conference, carrying on their search for new ways to resolve problems that threaten the peace of the world. The meeting of the four nations is to prepare the way for a later summit conference with the leader of the Soviet Union. President Eisenhower arrives with British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. Shortly after noon, the meeting is joined by Chancellor Konrad Adenauer of the Federal Republic of Germany. It is a fruitful meeting. Agreement is reached to invite the Soviet Premier to a summit conference the following spring. First of a series of talks, the Western powers hope will alleviate tensions and promote a durable peace. The journey is nearing its conclusion now. Spain displays its colorful pageantry for the President of the United States. The visiting chief executive is welcomed to Spain by Generalissimo Francisco Franco. And outside, as the two leaders chat, the great avenues of Madrid are alive with the calls of encouragement for the man on the mission of peace. Last stop before his return, Morocco, the first country to recognize the United States after the achievement of American independence. More than half a million people watch the motorcade. At the palace, the president sums up the ultimate purpose of his unprecedented 11-nation tour. To assure that a devastating war shall not again pit human against human, threatening all civilization and human survival. Casablanca ends the historic 11-nation goodwill tour. Christmas is approaching in Washington, where despite the late hour, an enthusiastic crowd is at the airport. Everywhere I went, President Eisenhower says, 
people sent back a message of goodwill to the people of the United States. For Mr. Eisenhower, a fond welcome home from Mrs. Eisenhower. Every Christmas Eve at the White House, the President lights the national Christmas tree. 18 hours after his return, a report on his journey of peace and friendship. Fellow Americans at home and overseas, friends of America, workers for a just peace wherever you may be in the world, whatever your race or flag or tongue or creed. Once again, I have the privilege of lighting the pageant of peace tree on the eve of the Christmas season. Last night, I came home from a trip that carried me to three continents, Africa and Asia and Europe. In the crowds that welcomed my party and me, I saw at close hand the faces of millions. They were Buddhist and Muslim and Hindu and Christian. We must, as individuals, as corporations, labor unions, professional societies, as communities, multiply our interest and our concern in these peoples. They are now our warm friends. They will be our stout and strong partners for peace and friendship in freedom if they are given the right sort of help in the right sort of spirit. I fervently hope that in this Christmas season, each of you who is listening will give thought to what you can do for another human identical with you in his divine origin and destiny, however distant in miles or poor in worldly estate. With that hope, with that prayer, I wish you all happiness and peace in this season as I light the nation's Christmas tree for the pageant of peace. Uh -huh.